I again ask our brother, what if some serious soul should scruple at one or more articles of our confession of faith? Will he therefore lay aside the confession of faith when he baptizes children? Or can any confession of faith be framed, but according to our author's way of reasoning, some serious souls may be found who may scruple at some expressions in them? At this rate, all confessions of faith must be banished out of the churches of Christ. This is indeed very agreeable unto the lax principles he has vented, but opposite to all the principles of the Reformed churches. He reflects upon the Act of Assembly, 1639, Session 23, ordaining particularly masters of universities, schools, and all scholars at the passing of their degrees to subscribe the covenant. But does it not well become an assembly to be careful that such as have the trust of teaching youth be sound in their principles? And, as for the matter of passing of the degrees, why might not the assembly require of such who would graduate in the universities an evidence of their soundness in the faith? This was not a new thing in this church. It was ordained by the assembly in 1581 and always practiced in the universities even from the foresaid year to the 1638, as the Latin historian reports in pages 59 and pages 63. As for the Act of Assembly 1640, Session 10, declaring that any expectant who refused the covenant should not have liberty of rescinding in a burg, uh, residing, excuse me, in a burg. As this act is confined to expectants, so that assembly had no doubt some particular grounds and reasons for a declaration of this nature. And since I do not know their reasons, I shall not take it upon me either to justify or condemn their declaration. But it is laid in their act. It appears to be a civil penalty, and the most that can be said against it, that it was a mistake in the administration. And, as for that Act of Assembly, 1648, Session 31, ordaining all young students to take the covenants, after the heavy charges that our author has brought against it, what is it that the Assembly ordain? If is even, uh, it is even this, that such as enter into the colleges who are supposed to come to the years of discretion should renew their baptismal engagements to the Lord or declare expressly their adherence to the same. With respect to the Solemn League and Covenant, there are two exceptions laid against it by our author. The one is, on page 84, that all sort of prelacy was not abjured by the second article of that covenant, particularly the scheme proposed by Archbishop Usher. He ought to have told his reader what this scheme was, but not to insist upon this. I shall only observe that in the first article of the Solemn League they expressly swear to the preservation of the Reformed religion in the Church of Scotland in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government. I hope it will not be alleged that any sort of prelacy obtained in the government of the Church of Scotland at that time. Our Presbyterian Church government was then in its vigor and purity, and our government is owned in this covenant as a breach of the Reformed religion in Scotland and the swearers of the Solemn League and Covenant bind themselves to the preservation of this reformed government and discipline. But this they could never have done in a, con in a consistency with their acknowledging any sort of episcopacy. When the author from the historian he refers to mentions some great men in the Westminster Assembly who would not abjure all sort of episcopacy, both he and such historians leave a blot upon the memory of these great men. It is upon the matter of charging them with dealing deceitfully in such a solemn transaction. Likewise, on page 185, he lays another exception against some words in the third article of the Solemn League. Quote, Might not, says he, some persons of weaker capacity, having the truth of grace, scruple to swear that with their estates and lives they should defend the rights and privileges of the Parliament? Unquote. To which I answer that some persons of weak capacity, who may have the truth of grace, will sometimes scruple at these things that are most obvious and plain, and in this case they should be informed and instructed. But further, as the case was stated in our covenanting period, an arbitrary power was claimed by the sovereign. It was likewise in many instances exercised, particularly when taxes were imposed without consent of Parliament as in England, and when the Parliament was prorogued or dissolved at the pleasure at pleasure as in Scotland, 1639 and 1640, the estates of the kingdom did at the same time protest against their prorogation as contrary to their just rights and privileges, and I doubt not that the subjects of the weakest capacity might have so much knowledge in the question as it was stated at that time, that they could, with judgment and knowledge, swear the above article of the covenant. And, upon this head, I may ask our author, is there not as much, if not more difficulty in some expressions in the oath of abjuration, even as it is calculated for the ministers of Scotland? As, for instance, when they are obliged to swear that they shall defend his majesty's person and government against all traitorous conspiracies and attempts whatsoever, as also to disclose the same, might not some reckon it a difficulty to swear in such terms? 
In regard, they cannot define or determine what the law may reckon a traitorous conspiracy or attempt. Again, might it not be a scruple with others to swear His Majesty's right and title in all his other dominions belonging unto Great Britain? In regard, they do not know what all these dominions are, and it is like and it is like do not know what His Majesty's right and title is unto them? But I doubt not but our author will reckon such who move these difficulties to have but a weak capacity, when they cannot understand such comprehensive expressions. I have now done with the exceptions that our author lays against our covenants and the proceedings of our reforming period with reference unto them. I shall now briefly consider his exceptions against some other acts of the said period, which he brings as instances of the faults, failings, bad and tyrannical acts of our covenanting period. The first that I mention is the account that our author gives us of a clause in the Assembly's Directory, August 24th, 1647, for secret and private worship and mutual edification. Our author mentions only the seventh direction, but in order to understand it, it is necessary that I first transcribe their sixth, that is, at family worship a special care is to be had that each family keep by themselves, neither requiring, inviting, nor admitting persons from diverse families, unless it be those who are lodged with them or at meal or otherwise with them upon some lawful occasion. Then follows the seventh article mentioned by our author, that is, whatsoever hath been the effect, the fruits of meeting of persons of diverse families in the times of corruption or trouble, in which cases many things are commendable, which otherwise are not tolerable, yet... When God hath blessed us with peace and purity of the gospel, such meetings of persons or diverse families, except in cases mentioned in these directions, are to be disapproved as tending to the hindrance of the religious exercise of each family by itself to the prejudice of that public ministry. Our author gives it as his opinion that in the above direction the assembly declared against fellowship meetings for prayer and Christian conference. I know not by what spirit our author is led in his manner of writing, there cannot be a more unjust charge laid against an assembly than that is laid against the excellent directions that this assembly give for private and secret worship. And who is not blind may see from the above article that the direction here is given by that the direction here given by the assembly is that each family by itself should keep up the worship of God, and that which is condemned is the meeting of persons of diverse families together to the hindrance of the religious exercise of each family by itself. And this is what they have good reason to condemn as having a tendency to all the bad effects that they mention. Our author tells us from Guthrie in his memoirs that the above act or conclusion was unanimously gone into by several eminent ministers, some of whom he mentions who met to confer about that affair in Mr. Henderson's chamber, 1639. That is, an act of the assembly, 1647, was concluded by several ministers in 1639, even seven years before it was enacted. Our author tells us this story from Guthrie's memoirs. Several of his readers, and these none of the weakest, have hereby been imposed upon, and thought that our author told them this story from one of these eminent ministers, Mr. James or William Guthrie. But to undeceive them, I must inform them that this Guthrie was one Mr. Henry Guthrie, who made a considerable profession of zeal for our reformation before the year 1662, but at that time he complied with prelacy and received the bishopric of Dun Dunkeld as his reward in the year 1665. I sometimes made use of his memoirs for clearing or confirming some historical facts, but in this place the bishop tells us a very inconsistent story, that is, some, says he, come from England who were supposed to favor the brownistical way, and others likewise came from Ireland, who betake themselves to conventicles, having forsaken the public assemblies of the church in Ireland. And he tells us that they set up those conventicles, which they called private meetings in Scotland, and that they were countenanced by Mr. David Dixon, Mr. Samuel Rutherford, and others, and that the soundest of ministers, Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Henderson, and others, the bishop thinks fit to name himself among them, who were deeply affected with the said conventicles, doubting that the course might lead to Brownism. And therefore, they purposed to have an act of assembly in the year 1639 against the same. But Mr. Dixon and Mr. Rutherford opposed the motion, and instead thereof moved for a conference that brethren might unite upon the question, and, here, and that hereupon a conference was held in Mr. Henderson's chamber, wherein the above-mentioned conclusion was taken. He likewise reports that the keepers of the said conventicles or private meetings, having become more numerous and bold, the General Assembly at Aberdeen in the year 1640 took the matter into consideration, and that Mr. Dixon and Mr. Rutherford pleaded vehemently for the said conventicles till Mr. Guthrie, that is, the bishop himself, took the paper out of his pocket, 
which had been signed by Mr. Henderson and Mr. Dixon in all their names. And then, says the bishop, Mr. Dixon was silent, whereupon the act passed unanimously against private meetings. But everybody may see that the above account given by the bishop is both false and inconsistent. There was no such act as he reports passed at the assembly at Aberdeen in 1640. Nobody that know the character of Masters Rutherford and Dixon will believe that they favored the Brownistical way, or that they would oppose in any assembly a conclusion signed by the, with their own hands. It is plain that the perfidious prelate has laid the story with the design to defame these excellent and worthy men, and it is likewise plain that there was no such meeting in Mr. Henderson's chamber, concluding an article of our directory, which had not a being 1647, that is, seven years thereafter. Therefore, if our author had not a design to impose upon the world when he cites Guthrie's memoirs, he has quoted him without any manner of judgment or consideration. Our author tells us he is far from condemning private meetings or, pro or prayer. Uh, excuse me. Our author tells us he is far from condemning private meetings for prayer and conference. He owns that fellowship meetings, if rightly managed, are profitable. But in the meantime, he insists only upon the abuse of them but never tells us wherein they are profitable. He gives us a quotation from Mr. Durham on Scandal, Part 3, Chapter 15, and we have only the one half of what Mr. Durham says upon fellowship meetings, namely, what he says upon the abuse of them, but what is said by that great man upon the, useless, uh, the usefulness excuse me, of such meetings is entirely dropped by our author. I shall leave it to the reader to look into Mr. Durham himself. I shall only add, it is an unfair and very cunning way of dealing to commend a practice of anything as profitable and useful, and yet to insist only upon the abuses of the practice without giving any instances of the profitableness or usefulness thereof. The author of the essay on page 33 observes that the Brethren in the Judicial Act and Testimony, page 14, say, quote, that from 1641 the building of the house of God went on prosperously and successfully till 1650, unquote. And then he adds, quote, but if the robbing of Christian people, thus of their right to elect their pastors and many other bad acts made in that period, was a building of the house of God, I'm far mistaken, unquote. He gives us an instance of one of these bad acts, that is, quote, The Assembly 1642 says he ordains not the congregational but the el not the congregation, but the eldership shall have the filling up of vacancies in, in the session, unquote. As also on page one forty six he affirms that the said Act 1642 was a, quote, robbing the people of all right to elect their elders and deacons, unquote. Here our author charges the Assembly 1642 with a sacrilegious robbery, but to vindicate them from this charge, I shall transcribe our author's judgment upon the Act of Assembly in Full Vindication of the People's Right, page 53, when his antagonist throws up the above Act of Assembly unto him, he replies, quote, I shall suppose all the assembly meant by that act was only this, that the session should have the first nomination of such elders and deacons as should have been taken into the session, leaving still a liberty to the congregation to add or alter as they saw meet. And if so, though that act may differ from what the apostles did, it will not be in direct contradiction to it, unquote. Our author's above vindication is indeed clogged with an if after his ordinary dubious manner of expressing himself. Though for the above reason given by our author, I shall not absolutely condemn the Act of Assembly 1642 in the matter he thinks fit to do in his, in his essay, as if it were a robbing the people of all right to choose their elders and deacons, yet neither will I justify it in the terms in which it is laid, as if it were agreeable to apostolic pattern. But, after all, the Presbytery assert what is true when they affirm that the building of the house of God went on prosperously and successfully during that period, and after the particular instances they mention, they declare on page 18 that they do not intend to affirm, quote, that under the above-mentioned period there was nothing defective or wanting as to the beauty and order of the house of God, or that there was nothing culpable in the administration, unquote. I shall only add upon this head that the Act of the Assembly 1642 has always been observed in the practice since then, and for anything I know, long before it.